All right. Well, our preaching theme for 2022 is Begin Again. This year we're going to be revisiting, refocusing on some foundational things, beginning with our church values. Um, Last year, about this time, we formulated a vision statement. There are copies of that in membership information on our website. There's also some of those on the back information table if there's any of you that want to see the entire document. But when we began to formulate a vision for the church, we began with values. Asking the questions, what, what is really important to us? What are our priorities? Our vision must reflect our values. So we begin with values. I realize that because this is being recorded, we may be using this teaching in the future to um, help people who are interested in our church to know what our values are. So if you're listening sometime in the future, I hope that while our preaching themes and perhaps even our vision may have been rearticulated or have changed, I hope that long into the future, our values are still pretty much the same. Last week we talked about the importance of the Word and of the Spirit, but mostly the Word last week. The Word and the Spirit, they work together to communicate from God to us. But today we're going to focus on the Spirit. Two out of our seven value statements are about the Holy Spirit. Lester Zimmerman, the apostolic leader of the Hopewell Network of Churches, describes our churches as a convergence of Pentecostal charismatic stream, the evangelical stream, and the Anabaptist streams, all coming together. Now, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, you know, the Pentecostal and charismatic stream, they're all about the Holy Spirit, right? But they focus mostly on the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. That's actually value number five. We'll get to that one. But evangelicals and Anabaptists usually pay more attention to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And that is our focus for today. So here's value statement number three. We value the Holy Spirit's guidance and correction as we are being transformed into the image of Christ. We want to be compassionate and inclusive to all who are on the journey towards freedom and healing as Christ is formed in us. But we also want to hold each other accountable to be moving forward in our spiritual growth and in integrity. So the Holy Spirit, one of his jobs is to make us more like Jesus. He guides, he corrects, he convicts, he shapes us into the character of God as seen in Jesus Christ. Now, the Hopewell Network of Churches grew out of the Mennonite Church. It actually wasn't all that long ago, maybe, what, two decades ago, we were part of the Mennonite Church. And some of us grew up in that, grew up in the Mennonite Church, and have seen dramatic changes over our lifetime as to how the church perceives and practices sanctification. Now, most of you know my father, And some of you knew my mother. And when they were young, when they were young adults growing up in the church, yeah, they looked pretty much like that. As a matter of fact, that looks a lot like their wedding photo. Right there. Outward forms of conduct, your dress, was extremely important. Sometimes even more important than inward holiness and your heart towards God. For example, my father tells the story, I don't know if he's ever told the story over the pulpit, but I've gotten his permission to tell it for him. My father tells a story when he was, they were having a series of meetings, he was leading worship, which back then, you know, as a chorister, no instruments, just keeping time. He spilled coffee on his plain coat. Now, those of you who don't know or don't remember what a plain coat looked like, it looked like that right there. And that was the approved clothing choice for church. He also had a lapel coat 
that he wore to farm meetings and things like that. And, and that was okay sometimes, but this little thing here was a big problem. Okay, I just reviewed the story with my dad this week, and I was like, was it the coat that was a problem? He's like, no, he says it was the tie. Ties were considered worldly. So he spilled coffee on his coat, and that evening he decided to wear his lapel coat and a tie. Big no-no. And he was reprimanded for that. Now that led to a series of experiments by him and my mother to try to understand what the standard was and how they were being judged. You know, they were disciplined for their clothing choices and eventually silenced, which for those of you who don't know means they were no longer allowed to lead worship or to teach Sunday school because they were under the discipline of the church. Now at that time, in the Mennonite church, the outward appearance of holiness had evidently become more important than the inward working of the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's that missing ingredient of the inward working of the Holy Spirit that eventually led to the hunger that I witnessed at the Bible study in Spring City here, which became this church. It was that hunger for God, that missing ingredient that led to the revival that started at Elverson as people were discovering the Holy Spirit and finding out that there was more to this inner life than just the outward forms. After all, Christianity has to be more than just rules. The Christian life is power. Where is the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to transform us? That's the question everyone was asking. And this is what this value and this message is all about. The Holy Spirit transforms us by the renewing of our mind. And we participate in that process by putting off some things and putting on other things. And ultimately, the goal of the Holy Spirit in sanctification is that we be perfected in love. Now, if you're following along on your insert or on your bulletin online, you know that I just gave you my outline for this morning's message. But let's take a look first at renewing the mind. We're going to begin with a scripture that we used two weeks ago when I preached on the value of worship, but we're going to continue on to the next verse. So Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And here's your first fill in the blank. Renewing the mind begins on the inside. Begins on the inside. Sometimes the church has inadvertently conveyed the message that to be a good Christian you need to appear to have it all together. Just look right and do what you're told. Let everybody think you have it all together. Meanwhile, you may be falling apart on the inside. But as long as you look good, you're a good Christian. That was what my parents experienced. Do you know that the doctrine that the church preached was actually called nonconformity? It was from the first part of this verse, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. But they neglected the second part, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And if you think I'm being hard on the Mennonite church, the Mennonite church was not the only place this was happening. This was happening in many churches, in many places. 
In fact, in 1991, Larry Crabb, one of the pioneers of Christian counseling, wrote a book called Inside Out. Recognize that cover? Sandy, I'm sure you have it in your library. Carrie does. I do. In this book, Crabb exposed the superficial attempts of people and churches to make changes on the surface while ignoring the inner pain. The pain that, when acknowledged, can produce real change. Here's a quote from that book. The awareness of what's inside forces me to admit that I am utterly dependent on resources outside my control for the kind of change I desire. If helplessness is really at the core of my existence, I prefer to live on the surface of things. It's far more comfortable. To admit that I can't deal with all that's in me strikes a death blow to my claim of self-sufficiency. To deny the frightening realities within my soul seems as necessary to life as breathing. You know, what he's describing there is that, that struggle. No, I, I can't show on the surface what's really going on in, inside. I just, I just need to keep it together. I just need to look like I have it together. I just need to make everybody believe that I'm okay and just keep stuffing things down inside. You know, for many years, that's what many of us believed the Christian life was. But it's not. You know, that book was one of the influences that changed my life and changed my view of what it means to be a Christian. It moved me from thinking like I need to act like I have it all together to realize that if I want Jesus to change me, I have to let myself fall apart. Fall apart in a safe environment where God and other people who is put in my life can reshape me and restore me in the power of his Holy Spirit. Oh, and by the way, this is also the value expressed in our second process step, restore. Here's the next fill in the blank. Renewing the mind is a process. It begins on the inside, but it is a process. I talked about how this value was shaped by what we learned from our Anabaptist or Mennonite roots. But you know, a similar problem developed in evangelical churches around the misconception that if a person is just properly saved, the transformation is somehow instantaneous. You may have heard this, or you may have heard this in between the lines, that Christians shouldn't have problems, at least not sin problems. And if you're still having those problems, well, you just need to Get saved all over again. That was the message. And then that message was reinforced by the glorious testimonies of these people with their dramatic con uh, um, com conversions. You know, after I gave my life to Jesus, I never touched alcohol again. I never had the desire for cigarettes. I never had the desire for this or that or anything else. And it's leaving the people there thinking, what's wrong with me? Why am I still struggling? Why was it not instantaneous? You know, the truth is, is that God does change hearts and lives. And looking back, sometimes it looks like it was instantaneous. But the truth is that for many or most, it was a process. The struggle is real. <laughs> And that's why I included the language that I did in describing this value because I want us to know that it's a process and for many people it's a struggle. And this is what I put. We want to be compassionate and inclusive to all who are on the journey towards freedom and healing as Christ is formed in us. You know, today we have a generation of people, many of whom have written off church because they or their parents were wounded by that pressure to be perfect. The world's changed. People are more open about their sin and their struggles. And they want a church that's going to accept them as they are. You know, I 
was thinking about this. We're celebrating Sanctity of Life Sunday. Well, next year or next next Sunday, we're going to have a special speaker. He's on the other side of that issue, not just dealing with unwanted pregnancy, but dealing with human trafficking and rescuing women who have been sucked into a lifestyle, many times against their will, um, and how to restore them. This ministry was operating in the church that I pastored before this church, and, and some of these women came and attended the church. In fact, they sat in the second row right behind me, and I got to greet them every Sunday. I got to baptize one of the women who is featured on their website in her testimony, Nikki. I got to baptize her. They're moving now over into Chester County, and they're setting up a store down in Phoenixville, and I'm wanting to welcome this ministry, but then that brings up a question for us as a congregation. What if we have women starting to attend our church that are part of a safe house, that are being rescued from a lifestyle of prostitution? Are we ready to welcome them without judging them? I hope so. Yeah. The church has been afraid to accept people and their issues for fear that we might be perceived as saying that sin is okay. But we're not saying that what the Bible calls sin is okay. We're just saying it's okay to not be okay. You get it? It's normal to struggle. And healing and freedom is a journey. And if that's your journey, if you're watching this morning and thinking, I'm just going to check this church out online because I want to know it's safe before I try going there. We want you to know that this is a safe place where you can be healed and restored. We want it to be a safe place where we understand the journey because guess what? We're still people on a journey. And every one of us is still on that journey to some degree. The next fill in the blank is this. Renewing the mind is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Renewing the mind according to Crab and many others is, begins with recognizing that we are helpless to change ourselves. And that's why being religious in the terms of promoting outward behavior modification is such a big lie. Not only does it deny that the problem still exists, but it denies the real power of God to heal and to transform. If you could change yourself, you wouldn't need God. But you can't change yourself. And that's why you need God. That's why we consider the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification to be such a high value. You know, we have workshops here at Spring City Fellowship. We're having one next Saturday that's part of our restore process. And we encourage people to benefit from teaching in small groups. But this value is not self-help. This value is a work of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we come to these seminars, yes, you can learn a lot of things to help yourself, but ultimately it's not about what you can do for yourself. It's about what you can let the Holy Spirit do in you. And that's why we bathe these workshops and these teachings in prayer. Because we want God to do in us what we cannot do in ourselves. The Holy Spirit does not just empower teachers to teach but he helps those who listen and attend to apply what they're hearing. You know, as I'm preaching now, I realize that each and every one of you has a different situation. Each and every one of you has different things going on in your life. So as I'm speaking and the Holy Spirit is helping me to speak, I know that the Holy Spirit is also on the other end helping you to hear, helping you to receive, helping you to know what to do with the words that are being spoken. The Holy Spirit searches our hearts and he knows our minds. The Holy Spirit uses us to minister to one another. And as we recognize the Spirit's work 
and we open ourselves to that work, then the Holy Spirit is able to heal us and change us from the inside out. And that brings me to the second part, putting off and putting on. So we've established that the process of sanctification is from the inside out, that it's a process, and that it's primarily the work of the Holy Spirit. Now we get to the part that asks, what's my part in this? Let's look at Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. Paul writes, Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous and they've given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupted through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and in holiness. Here's how I'm going to summarize that. Your next fill in the blank. Recognize that you have choices. Recognize that you have choices. Now here's the thing that's ironic about this scripture. First of all, Paul is writing to Gentiles and he's telling them not to live like Gentiles. Did you get that? <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but they know something now that they did not know before. And it means that they now have a choice. You can just go with what you know, <clears throat> with what's most convenient, familiar, comfortable. Or you can make a choice to do something different. The problem with having a free will, and all of us have a free will. The problem is, is that most of us don't use it. Choices require effort. Let me give you an illustration. My wife spends a lot of time thinking about what to prepare for meals. She'll ask me, sometimes, multiple times a day, what do you want for dinner? To which I usually reply, I don't know. What I really mean is, I don't want to make the effort to decide, right? Meals are usually determined by whatever we have in the refrigerator that's about to spoil. <laughs> or whatever we have in the freezer that's just taking up space. Actually, it's a huge privilege that we have access to and are able to afford such a wide variety of food. But so often that Privilege is eclipsed by the paralysis of having to make a choice. You know, in America, we call it choice overload. Too many choices actually makes it harder to choose. Now, when it comes to our lives and the choices we make, there's also infinite number of possibilities. But do you know that most of us will only make the same choices over and over and over again unless we encounter other influences. <laughs> Just like you probably, Steve, you prefer the food your mother made, right? Until you try something else, right? I'm picking on Steve because I'm picking on Steve because I know he's picky about food. You know, I, I was the same way, but once I tasted my wife's cookie and I never went back. Once you made the choice to live for Christ, your focus has shifted. Your view has just opened up to a wider array of choices than you knew you had before. But it may take a while for those choices to catch up. It's the process of putting off and putting on. Now, when I went to Bible school, and I'm talking a long time ago, I had a list in my mind of the things that I wanted to see changed. 
I actually had a list of things that I wanted God to do in my life. Do you know how long it took God to accomplish that list? (laughs) Actually, that list, about three weeks. About three weeks from the time I arrived at school, I looked back and I could just check out every, every question I had, everything that I wanted to see God do, God had done in three weeks. And then I was standing there like, okay, God, that was my list. What's your list? <laughs> I actually found myself strangely discontent. Like, I thought that once I just dealt with these things in my life, I would feel great. I would feel confident. I would feel like I had it all together. But, you know, at the end of those three weeks, I felt even more weak and insecure. And I, I just, I felt empty. Like, God, I need you so much. What do I do without you? And then somebody told me about putting off and putting on. So you know that feeling that you have right now? (laughs) Well, it's like if I was to give you a new set of clothes, what are you going to have to do? (laughs) You're going to have to take off what you're wearing in order to put it on. That means being vulnerable. That means at least for a little while you're going to be exposed while you're in this process of putting off and putting on. And I felt exposed. I felt like I was naked before God. In fact, while we were going through this process, and I've shared about the revival that happened at school one time, one of our professors, the the school was called Christ for the Nations, he made one of those slips he got up, and he said, Welcome to Christ for the Naked. But it felt like that at times because of the putting off and the putting on. Here's the next fill in the blank. Let the Holy Spirit inspire your choices. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Putting on the new means that we think differently and therefore we choose differently. That's why we need our minds to be renewed. Or as it said back in the Ephesians passage, for the spirit of our minds to be renewed. What does that mean except that our minds are led by our spirit, our subconscious orientation, our internal compass, our guiding sense of reality? And then in Colossians, Paul clarifies that our new reality is really centered on Christ. We are in Christ. Our home is above Our future and our destiny is resurrection life. Now the role of the Holy Spirit becomes much clearer. We need help living in this new reality. We need a guide to the heavenly life. We need inspiration, someone or something to influence us to think beyond what we are used to thinking. We need the Holy Spirit to inspire our choices, to help us see beyond what we would normally see or choose. Colossians 3 goes on to name what some of those choices are. I'm not going to read the whole chapter this morning. You look at it on your own time. Paul gets very specific about what Gentile believers are to put off and to put on. And your choice of what to put on is guided by who you are in Christ. So let me just say it this way, and this is your next fill in the blank. Choose a life surrendered to God. Choose a life surrendered to God. I'm going to skip to the end of the chapter, verse 14. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, 
to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Look at that. Let the peace of Christ rule. You were called to one body. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. These words imply one choice that influences all of our other choices. The choice to surrender to God. It's a choice that says, I've tried doing things my own way and I keep messing up, so God, I'm going to do things your way. It's a choice that says, I don't know what's right or best for my own life. God, you created me. You show me what to do. You know better than I do. It's the choice that says, I can't do what I want to do even when I want to do it. I need the power of the Holy Spirit just to live. If you make that one choice, then the Holy Spirit will help you to make all of the other choices. But that one choice has to be your choice. Do you see where this is going? What's going to happen? What's the Holy Spirit going to do to me? Well, I already said it. He's going to make you more like Jesus. And that brings us to the last section. Perfected and love. Here's the next fill in the blank. These three points have to do with our goals. So the goal of our faith is Christ-likeness. The goal of our faith is Christ-likeness. Here's what it says in 1 John 3, 1 to 3. So what kind of, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Some of us may be under the impression that being a Christian is about being a member of a church, following the rules, doing what's expected of us. The Bible says it's about identity. It's about who we are and whose we are. It's about being in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, and thereby becoming children of God. You know, God doesn't want a bunch of people who just blindly follow his rules. He wants fellowship. Real relationship. That's what he's wanted from the beginning. He wants, to know, he wants us to know him and to obey him because we know him and because we have chosen his way over our own. You know, living lives as Christians just on the surface, it deprives us of that relationship with God and with others. What do I mean? Well, we can't let people get close because they might discover our faults. They might discover that things are not okay underneath the surface. But when the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us, then we don't need to be afraid to open up to God and to others. Because we know that whatever is in there is in process. And God is going to bring that process to completion. We'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Second fill in the blank. The goal of sanctification is holiness. 
The goal of sanctification is holiness. Now, sanctification is one of those words that we don't use outside of church, but it literally means to become holy. God is holy, perfect, set apart from sinful humanity. Whether Mennonite or evangelical or any other church background, the goal has always been sanctification or holiness. The problem is that when we try to look like we've arrived at that goal, but have not yet surrendered to the Holy Spirit and the process, <laughs> we're not actually there. Have you ever seen a movie set? They're usually just the fronts of buildings made to look like a street, but there's actually nothing behind them. It's called a facade. There doesn't need to be anything back there because all that matters is what you see through the camera. It's a facade. The world is full of facades built by people who only have an earthly point of view. And sometimes the church is one of them. As long as people think we look good, that should be all that matters. But what we call holiness may be just a facade. What's the alternative? The alternative is to be real about our human failings and not deny it. But at the same time, we're not defined by our failings because of who we are becoming. That's what defines us. That's why even though we want to be accepting and inclusive of people where they are in the process, we don't stop there. This is what we also say in that statement. We also want to hold each other accountable to move, moving forward in our spiritual growth and in integrity. We don't stop at just admitting that we're imperfect. But we spur one another on. Holiness is something we will never achieve on our own. We need each other and the power of the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus. We need to love each other and help each other as the Holy Spirit is working in each of us. You know, that trial, that test that you went through can be a benefit to somebody else because you can truly identify with where they are at. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow. That verse, that verse hits me in the face like a brick. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But as I remember what the church used to consider perfect, it's like, no, that's not right because that perfection was just a facade. So God, what do you mean? What does it mean to be perfect? Well, here's your next fill in the blank. The goal of perfection is love. Look at the context. The goal of perfection is love. The story I told in the beginning about in this message about my father's experience with the church shows that the church is just trying to be holy by isolating itself from the world. But the goal of perfection is love. So that's messed up. Most of the churches that I know these days have figured out that that doesn't work. 
Although there's still a few of them out there trying it that way. Perfection is first and foremost not about behavior modification. You have to change from the inside out. Perfection is about love. And more specifically, it's about loving the way God loves. If perfection were about behavior, God could have made robots to do exactly what they were programmed to do. But God didn't do that. If perfection were about the absence of sin or the absence of imperfection, God could have wiped everyone out and started over. Well, in fact, he did do that. But guess what? Sin survived. Because it's in us. But instead, we see a God who is extremely tolerant of a humanity which generally ignores and sometimes even opposes him. If God's goal from creation until now has been to have a people who will love him and to love the way he loves, well, then that all makes sense. It was worth all of the mistakes and failures. It was worth all of the pain and suffering. It was worth patiently waiting for to have a people who recognize that God has loved them even when they didn't deserve it. And a people who decide to learn to love God and to love others the way God has loved them. This is the first job of the Holy Spirit, is to convince you of God's love. And then part of that job is to bring you to the place where you begin to love the way God loves. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand and worship and commune with God as you do. And let God transform you from the inside out.